It's the summer of 79, and someone is sexually assaulting young women in a Virginia college town. We concluded that we had a serial rapist. People were scared to death. Investigators have little to go on. We were desperate. We wanted any help we could get. Under the gun to solve the case, the police turn to a psychic. This rapist is apologizing to me. There's obviously some powers at work there. Oh my gosh, well, what are we into? Will the psychic help the police to stop a serial rapist before he becomes a serial murderer? Stanton, Virginia, a small, sleepy southern town nestled in the Shenandoah Valley, the birthplace of Woodrow Wilson, the 28th president of the United States. It was a city of 20, 25,000, but it was sort of caught in time. But on the evening of March 14, 1979, Stanton's peace is shattered. A knife-wielding rapist attacks a 22-year-old student in her room at the local college. It is the first in what would be a string of violent sexual assaults. Stanton Police Department. I just remember getting the call, and the lady was very hysterical and upset, which, of course, anyone would have been going through that. I just remember how I felt so scared and helpless. My main thing was to try to keep her calm until a police officer could arrive. Detective Ronnie Wiseman is put on the case. Our first rape was very unusual because we had very few rapes at all. And this one seemed to be rape from a stranger. All police have to go on is a composite drawing of the assailant based on the victim's vague description. Then, two and a half months later, a second rape, only blocks away from the college. Again, few clues for the police. A person came in a window on each one. He used a knife and he had a uh, stocking mask on. And so our best description was height and weight, race. Um, that's about it. Both victims described their attacker as a large African-American. But because of the mask, they can't see his features and he leaves few clues. Ray Robertson is the prosecutor for the city of Stanton. Back in 1979, we didn't have DNA evidence any foreign hairs, any semen, any saliva, anything like that that we found on them, we could get the DNA on that now. We couldn't do that back in 1979, and so it's a very different game when it comes to solving crimes now from what it was back then. We just had no evidence. With a violent rapist on the loose, the whole town is on edge. For something like that to happen around here was a really big deal. That kind of stuff just didn't happen in Stanton. It made me be much more aware. Any place I went, I was always checking, being more cautious. During that particular time, women were kind of afraid to walk streets at night alone, especially in the college area. All the windows were down and locked. In a town where serious crime is all but unheard of, the pressure on local police for results is immense. The community was actually in pretty much of an uproar. I was following the, uh, the news in the newspaper uh, daily, especially on this case, because there was so much turmoil. I would say, well, I, I don't envy the, the police officers that's working this case because it's got to be tough. Everyone that you would come in contact with, regardless of what you were doing, uh, wanted to know how the case was going. Then, driving by a construction site, the victim of one of the rapes spots the man she thinks attacked her. One of the victims said, that, that's him, that's him. There's no question about it. Police arrest the man, but they soon realize the case against him is flimsy. The guy wore a stocking mask. I, how can you make an identification of a, of a suspect that has a stocking mask on? I think everyone knew that it was not right. He had been convicted of minor offenses that were very different from the type of offenses that a rapist usually commits, and I really didn't think he had done it. No sooner is the first suspect released than the other rape victim names a different man, a man she vaguely knows, and he too is arrested. He actually flunked the polygraph test, so on the basis of the victim identification and the polygraph results, uh, he was arrested. Everyone uh, seemed to say, oh boy, uh, we got the guy. We can relax a little bit. But the police don't relax for long. Less than a month later, a third attack, just like the first two. 
Wearing a stalking mask and wielding a knife, a man climbs through a window and rapes a 32-year-old woman. All this while the investigator's prime suspect is behind bars. The second person that was arrested was in jail when the third incident happened. Really didn't think we had two people doing this acts. The suspect is released. It's very sad. The police were scrambling to get an arrest in the case. Women were on edge, and uh, we were getting a little frustrated and, and maybe a little antsy, too, to, to solve some of these things. With three identical yeah. attacks, police believe, unless stopped, the man will almost certainly rape again. We realized after about two or three, we, we had a serial rapist. This, this is something that was very new. We'd never had anything like this. Under intense pressure, Detective Wiseman calls in Special Agent Daryl Stilwell of the state police. You had a person uh, that was operating within about a five block area. There were all types of sightings, uh, window peepings, entries into houses, burglaries, thefts of small items. The perpetrator's rapid escalation from petty burglary to violent rape makes police fear what he'll do next. The possibility that something will go down, uh, a resistance that will cause a homicide. There's always the possibility of that. Then, six months after the rapes began, a chance event changes the whole course of the investigation. Psychic Noreen Rainier arrives in town to give a talk at the local college about ESP and the paranormal. I had been teaching at Blue Ridge Community College, and at the very end of my lecture, a young lady stood up in the audience and asked me if I would do a public service. I said yes, and she told me that there had been a rapist in the town, and her sister had been one of the victims, and if I could hold her ring and see if I picked up anything. Noreen uses psychometry, a common psychic technique. It seems that object has memory or goes beyond memory, and I can see images in my head. Noreen holds the victim's ring while the student records her response. And I remember holding it and picking up several pieces of information that came into my mind. Uh, she had a tape recorder and was taping it. Despite knowing nothing about the case, Noreen immediately connects with the horror that is gripping the town. I felt this small, peaceful, beautiful community was terrorized, certainly the women, because of this rapist attacking again and again. Noreen also claims to see details of the actual crime. I remember uh, seeing a um, stalking mask. Oh, over. Desperate to see her sister's attacker brought to justice, the student takes the tape recording of the psychic to the police. A stalking mask. The cops are doubtful at first, but agree to listen to the tape. Like the student, they are impressed with what Noreen has to say. The sister had. Noreen told us this guy had used a stocking mask uh, and a knife in all his rapes. All the things that the victim had told us uh, that never were reported in, in the media. Well, we were uh, sort of in disbelief. How does she know this? Because these things weren't out. On September 2nd, a fourth woman is raped. The victim, a young woman who was babysitting for friends. And then, a few weeks later, the rapist, wearing his trademark stocking mask, strikes again, this time a 23-year-old woman. The public image of the Stanton Police Department plummeted. It was a worst-case scenario. With the attacks becoming more frequent and more brazen, the cops are willing to try anything even a psychic. We were desperate. We wanted any help we could get. Dabbling in the paranormal to solve a crime is not conventional police procedure. We had no idea what we were getting into, and it, it just, it was very new. I think that when the police first agreed to work with me, they had no clues, and he kept raping, and they had no information, so they thought, what do we have to lose? Can a psychic working with detectives help to track down a sexual predator before serial rape turns to murder? And we looked at each other and thought, oh my gosh, well, what are we into? In the summer of 1979, a violent sexual predator is haunting Stanton, Virginia. We concluded that we had a serial rapist. Five violent rapes have been committed by a mysterious masked man carrying a knife. With few leads, the police have all but hit a wall. The public image of the Stanton Police Department plummeted. It was a worst-case scenario. 
In desperation, the detectives turn to psychic Noreen Rainier, who has offered to help. I was just nervous. I had never worked with the police before. Today, Noreen Rainier is one of America's best-known psychics. But before Stanton, she had never worked with the police. So my own concern was, will my mind be able to do what they want? The first thing investigators do is take Noreen to the home of the third victim, the sister of the student Noreen had met. We just let her go, didn't say a word, like, yeah, you're right, or no, you're wrong, or anything. We didn't chat, you know, we just went, hello, hello, and I started working. We took Noreen to this house. About halfway up the steps, she said he came in that window right there. The rapist had climbed into the window and had touched the banister. Noreen's vision uncannily matches what the investigators already believe. We found a ladder laying in the yard, and we came to determine that the person went in a upstairs side window. These things had never gotten out. How could the psychic know something that hadn't been released to the public and the media? When he opened the window, in order to get in, he just had to sort of jump to the banister. That banister had given police the one hard piece of physical evidence they have. They'd gotten a real good palm print where he had to grab the banister. Walking through the home, Noreen's paranormal visions of the attack come thick and fast. He was already waiting for her when she got home. They said, show us. She pointed to a room and said uh, he was uh, waiting back in that room for the victim to come home. That was true also. Before she got to the bedroom, she said, there's some violent activity up here. They looked at each other, but they didn't say anything. And then we walked in. She walked in the bedroom and uh, sat down on the bed. And she started talking as if uh, she were the victim. Stutters. Noreen's description of the attack matches every detail of the victim's report. The rapist had come in the window. He had been hiding in wait. He had attacked her in her bedroom. Now, eerily, Noreen claims she has taken on the role of the victim and reveals something startling about the rapist. He's apologizing to me. And I was so shocked. But it just came, it just was like a little scene from a movie, just that one quick little picture, and I could hear his words. I'm sorry. This bizarre detail that the rapist apologizes to his victims is already known to the investigators. She was in a car accident night. He spoke to each victim carried on very uh, apologetic conversations. And he apologized uh, to some of the victims. It was very, very unusual. But the psychic claims to have one more detail about the rapist. Oh, I feel like his pants and shirt, they match. He's wearing a uniform. I, I could feel the material, and it, uh, uniforms have a, a special heaviness to it. And I could tell that the pants and the shirt matched. We were in disbelief. How does she know this? Because these things weren't out. Noreen's first vision of the rapist suggests he's a laborer. But as she talks, she's also receiving other more cryptic psychic signals. What I'm seeing, it seems to be going around and around. The entire time, she would sit and talk, and she was drawing on the pad with, with a pencil, just drawing a perfect circle. Noreen is sure the circles she's drawing mean something, but exactly what she can't say. I remember first seeing him driving something. I remember uh, knowing that whatever he drove went around and around. She said, I have no idea what this means, but it has something to do with um, his occupation. Without knowing anything, the psychic has accurately described the attacks and given the investigators a profile of the serial rapist. There's obviously some some powers at work there. It, it must be. And, and I've pretty much concluded that in my mind based upon this particular case. Impressed with what they've learned so far, the detectives take Noreen to the home of the most recent victim. They never told me any information, never gave me any feedback. Taking me to a second victim's house, I knew, knew that I, I must be onto something. There, she has a vision that would provide police with a vital clue. She claims to see where the rapist lives. See this theater marquee, and I knew he lived real close. I remember feeling the brick. Which was very interesting because there was an old theater right in the vicinity where all this was occurring. And most of these things occurred within a mile and a mile and a half, you know, or just within five blocks. 
Noreen has told the cops where she believes the rapist lives, but she also knows how he can be identified. I wanted to go through his body to see if I could pick up any tattoos or scars. When I got to the knee, I could see the scar. I, first of all, I hurt. I remember the limping. Pretty deep scar on his um, leg that would cause him a slight limp. Very new to us, we had no idea. She was getting a pretty detailed um, picture of this uh, attack. Can the psychic's cryptic clues help the police to track down a rapist who's already attacked five women? And we had the information, but we didn't know what to do with it. In the summer of 1979, a serial rapist is terrorizing the college town of Stanton, Virginia. The police were scrambling to get an arrest in the case. There was a crisis of public confidence. Desperate, the investigators have enlisted a psychic. She said she was picking up energy, and she was taking on the role of this victim. I feel theater. I knew he lived real close, and I could have felt, I remember feeling the brick. She said he lived in an apartment right across from a movie theater. Brick apartment, she even stated. We did concentrate on the brick apartment building across from the um, movie theater. We were in playing cars, and we had them positioned all around, all around the city, and especially in that particular area. The community became absolutely racked with fear. There was a tremendous need to get this case solved. And it could have gone real bad for us. Armed with details provided by Noreen's extraordinary psychic visions, police stake out the movie house and other key locations in Stanton and lie in wait. We spent many sleepless nights on this case. We would stake out to two or three o'clock in the morning, then come back out about seven. Then, after two weeks of around-the-clock surveillance, on the evening of December 27th, a break. Stant Police Department. A call came in that uh, someone was peeking in the window. The call comes from a woman living less than a block away from the movie house. Ma'am, is the suspect still there? I understand, and I'll get an officer on We had one of our cars sitting right near the end of that driveway. Got a report of a person messing around the house, looking in the windows and this, that, and the other. And when he came out of the yard, it was a fenced yard he had to walk out of. When he came out of the yard, we stopped him and questioned him about his business in the area. And something else. He had a limp. Could this limp be linked to the scar the psychic predicted the rapist would have on his knee? Did you go for a minute? Wasn't his home. He didn't know anyone in the home. Told us he was looking for some boxes because he was moving. He told us, start telling us a, a number of things that just didn't make any sense. You got any weapons on you? Anything on you? I think we all looked at him and said, I think we have the right guy here. I don't think there was any question. Have the police got the right man? He does live by the theater. Watch your head. The peeping Tom is taken into custody without a struggle. That man is 22-year-old James Bruce Robinson of Stanton. Police charge him with attempted burglary. But is he the man responsible for raping five women? We knew we had him pretty well there for an attempted B&E, but at that point, we had no idea that he was the rapist. We did get his fingerprints, and um, I'd gotten a good palm print, so I took his palm prints, and um, we took those to the lab the next day. Then they remember one of Noreen's most detailed predictions. The rapist would have a big scar on his knee. It's very strange to ask him to uh, pull his pant legs up. He had no idea why we asked him that. I was so uh, excited when he pulled his pant leg up and showed me a great big scar there. So all of these things just started coming together. The psychic is right. But to nail Robinson, they need more. They need hard evidence. The evidence that we had was pretty, shall I say, skimpy on each one of these sexual assaults as far as linking anything particularly to him. We had, we had one palm print off of one of the scenes. The investigators devise a plan to persuade Robinson to confess. They take him to the scene of his crimes. It was a technique I used in, a, in many criminal investigations. Put, put him in a car and drive him to a neighborhood. We did a lot of 
running around in the car with him, asking him things as we drove by people's houses that he had uh, visited. And he started out uh, making confessions to uh, uh, trespasses and burglaries. That's how it started. Despite admitting to a string of burglaries, Robinson denies rape. But then, suddenly... Sir, the lab just called back. Your palm print matches your suspect. We got a call over the radio that the lab had called and matched that palm print. He knew exactly now that he's had it. Confronted with the evidence, James Robinson breaks down and confesses to the rapes. He, he gave the police details that only the true rapist could have known. There's little doubt that Noreen helped police put the serial rapist behind bars. Her remarkable insights were right on almost every count. She described how the perpetrator had entered the homes, how he had apologized to his victims. She told police the suspect lived close to a theater, that he limped, and he had a scar on his knee. This is Dixie Movie Theater. It's been here for years. And coincidentally, right across the street are the uh, Woodward Apartments and where the suspect was found to live. And what about those puzzling circles Noreen drew? The suspect drove cement mixer truck. He would leave the truck parked in front of the apartment or somewhere close, and he'd go in. I, I must admit I was very impressed by that he drives something that goes round and round, and it turned out to be a cement mixer truck. That was pretty cool. Noreen's vision of a man in uniform is also true. The night we picked him up, he had the shirt on. At the trial, the prosecution paint a chilling portrait of a man driven to rape and rape again. James Bruce Robinson pleads guilty and is sentenced to five concurrent 20-year sentences for the Stanton rapes. We were very impressed with Noreen and the information that she was able to give us. It gives you a little extra something to look for, you know, when you're out on the street. Everything that she gave came about. And then at the very end, when I left, as they were shaking my hands, they said, when will we catch him? And I thought for a second, and I said, uh, before Christmas. And we got him on December 22nd. Called me later to thank me for my Christmas present. In 1987, when two teenage girls are murdered in Thunder Bay, Canada, the police fear the worst. I immediately thought that we had a serial killer working the area. Police think they've got their man, but a psychic says they're wrong. I felt terrible, but I had to tell him. I'm having trouble recognizing the face I see. In the public's mind, it was going to be sort of a miracle if anybody was caught because so much time had elapsed. Then, 13 years later, a stone-cold case comes back to life. Was the psychic right all along? I knew I had seen that face so clearly. On the shores of Lake Superior sits Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. In the 1600s, a fur trading post. Today, a struggling industrial town. On Sunday, May 10th, 1987, Mother's Day, an elderly couple out on their morning walk discover the body of a young woman laying in a gravel pit. First to arrive on the scene is Constable Jerry Moran of the Ontario Provincial Police. The body was located right in, in the area here. The uh, top had been pulled up and her jeans were undone. Her shoes were removed and laid beside the body. Police comb the scene and find a plastic bag containing a beer bottle and what appears to be the undergarments of their victim. The thing that was going through my mind at the time was uh, somebody's Mother's Day had been ruined for the rest of their lives. But Detective Moran has a job to do and puts his personal feelings aside. It, you treat it very businesslike, you're, you're detached. Uh, any uh, short-lived evidence, anything that, that weather could, could uh, destroy, we have to try to preserve that as fast as possible. At the scene, police also find shoe prints and tire marks. The young woman is identified as 17-year-old high school student Donna Tebenham. 
The body of 17-year-old Donna Tebenham was found yesterday afternoon in a gravel pit north of the city. As for details, that's about all the OPP is releasing so far. The circumstances surrounding it dictates that uh, we are or have forwarded the uh, body to the Centre of Forensic Sciences in Toronto uh, for expert examination. Donna Tebenham was your typical 16-year-old girl. You know, she went to school, she had friends. Julio Gomes is a local journalist for the Thunder Bay Chronicle. I've lived all my life in Thunder Bay, and at the time I was uh, a teenager as well. And I know my own feeling was one of shock. An autopsy reveals she died of asphyxiation. There were small traces of alcohol in her body, but no drugs. A sample of semen is also recovered. Another curious clue. Tiny specks of blue paint were lifted from her clothing. The, the blue paint was uh, at one point used on a specific year of pickup trucks. Anybody that wanted to paint their vehicle could, could have painted it that blue, but we had established based on the wheelbase and the axle width that it was a truck. Police learned that Donna had spent the previous evening visiting friends. She was last seen walking back from a local corner store at about 11 p.m. Calls from the public kept police busy, but brought them no closer to a suspect. We had so many suspects, or what could be considered uh, persons of interest, but as it turned out, uh, in, in, in all the cases, it was a dead end. People uh, would, would come forward and, and just say that uh, they have reason to suspect this person because they said something. They said they may have seen this girl at a party, or they said that they went to school with this girl, and, and uh, they've done things to this girl, and things like that. There were blowhards at a party, most of them, that would just uh, want to get attention for themselves and, and admit to doing anything. And uh, all these, these guys were subsequently ruled out as, as suspects. Another snag. Partial fingerprints found on the beer bottle at the scene turn up no matches. With no suspects, and with no DNA testing in 1987, the semen sample sat on the shelf. The most promising clue police had appeared to be the blue repaint chips found on the body, but record keeping back then was less exact. Tracking down a blue repainted truck had to be done by sight. In this particular case, we were looking for a, a travel all, or an international travel all truck. It's like, a, it's like an old Chevy Suburban. So there weren't too many of them around, so we were, we were tracking those things down. And we spent months looking for everybody that was registered or had ever owned one of those. And uh, so that, that's all time consuming. Thunder Bay is a small town, and there are unfortunately a lot of other unsolved murders that take place, and every couple of years you'd have someone that disappears and they're never found. Then, Friday, August 7th, Another body is spotted off the side of the road, just a few miles from where Donna Tebenham was murdered three months earlier. The second victim is another Thunder Bay High School student, 16-year-old Bernadette LeClaire. We were supposed to go dancing. I didn't hear from her. I, I, I knew something was wrong. David Binquis was Bernadette LeClaire's boyfriend at the time she went missing. And I was just happened to be flipping through the newspaper, and uh, they had a little article about a native girl found in the power lines. My heart almost jumped out of my chest. The crime scene appears chillingly familiar to Constable Moran. The victims were uh, the same age. There was no obvious signs of, of violent death, but there was a plastic bag put over her head. Shoe prints and tire tracks match the Donna Tebenham scene. Police also make another key discovery. We found uh, blue repaint chips on both bodies. I uh, immediately thought that we had a serial killer working the area. Then police get a promising lead. A woman walks into the station and says she knows who the killer is. She claims her boyfriend, who we will call Ron Newman, picked up a woman at the same corner store where Donna Tebenham was last seen the night she went missing. She was allegedly an eyewitness to, to the actual apprehension. So the police questioned him, and then they arrested him. And he was charged with uh, two counts of murder. Attorney Lee Baig had been working on Ron Newman's case since the day the arrest was made police fingerprint Newman, but the prints don't match, and he doesn't drive a blue truck. 
but police aren't giving up so easily. We couldn't rule him out as a suspect just due to the fact that his prints didn't match what was found on, at our scene. Uh, he could have been wearing gloves. He could uh, very well not have touched anything. Nobody minds defending a guilty person, um, but when it's an innocent person, um, the task becomes so much more serious because you dare not make a mistake. And police would learn that they had made a big one. At a preliminary hearing, the OPP's case against Ron Newman falls apart. Well, she just didn't withstand cross-examination to the extent that the Crown had absolutely nothing to go on. There was no connection between my client and the murders whatsoever. Finally, after spending six months in jail, the charges are dropped. He was released, but unhappily for him, there was no one else to point the finger at. We weren't uh, defeated. We were, we were still interested in pursuing the case, uh, albeit from a different angle. That different angle was a psychic. One evening, I was watching uh, a documentary that involved a, a woman by the name of Noreen Rainier. The use of psychics in police investigations is commonplace, but in Canada, almost unheard of. Will the psychic lead the OPP to a brutal serial killer? I saw so clearly the face of the murderer. In Thunder Bay, Ontario, the murder of two teenage girls has the city demanding answers. Police have a suspect, but not enough evidence to convict. Desperate for clues, a cop calls a psychic. She had been successful with several American uh, agencies, so I thought we had nothing to lose. Noreen Rainier is a psychometrist who specializes in missing persons and homicide cases. I like uh, touching something off the victims, and metal is better for me. It seems to be a better conduit. It, it holds the energy or images of what that individual saw just before he or she was killed. Detective Moran sends her a pair of earrings found on Donna Tebenham, as well as a necklace from Bernadette LeClaire. When I first start a, a, a case, I have to prove to the police that I'm real. And so I always tell them a few things they already know, usually how the person was killed, what he or she looked like uh, when they were alive, a few things like that to gain their confidence in me as a, a credible psychic. And then uh, they can ask questions, and my mind uh, just sees what they ask. Yeah, I, I felt a little weird about the whole thing. I'd never been involved with a psychic. I'd never, I'd never even been to a tea reader, you know, but... Uh, I figured, what you know, if it works, who am I to argue with it? Like most of her cases, Noreen conducts her reading with Moran over the phone. When I held Donna's earring, uh, I remember seeing her sort of light brownish hair, and, and I feel she had problems with her S's. I see braces. She described the, the uh, victims uh, very accurately, uh, right down to uh, the speech impediment on Tebenham and the character of LeClaire. I had Bernadette's necklace, so it wasn't that difficult to be able to describe her. Busted. I felt more fuller lips. Yeah. I felt more, more feisty, confident, uh, a little bit rebellious, again young. Then Noreen astounds Moran by describing the murder. Remember, I couldn't breathe. Screaming. I'm having trouble breathing. Didn't feel any knives or guns or wounds of that sort, just not breathing. Uh, it started, you know, being a little uh, unusual that she would know some of this stuff, uh, and I certainly wasn't given this information to her. Again, I closed my eyes, and I could feel, uh, first of all, I felt a truck, and it was blue. It was low, and it had a, a sort of a, a flat thing in the back of it. I was somewhat surprised because that's the, the, the color of the vehicle we were looking for based on the paint chips found in both scenes. The eyes, I'm seeing the eyes now. Uh, on a face, when I close my eyes and I'm trying to describe the murderer, I don't see the whole face at one time. But the whole face is what the police need. So Noreen sets up a circle group, hoping to get a clearer picture of the killer. I, I'm seeing an eye. Uh, a circle group uh, is people with like minds. We're all, all hopefully trying to get the same answers. I was teaching at the time an ESP course, and some of my students had heard about the case that I was working on, and they wanted to become involved in it and help me see more. Large ears, more closer to the head. It was so clear. I saw it so clearly. I knew, I knew that if I had my artist draw it, that we would have a face for Constable Moran. 
She subsequently got a hold of, uh, of a sergeant from uh, an American police force that uh, had worked with her before, and uh, based on her description, he drew a composite sketch of what she thought our suspect should look like. Length. Uh, there was just a small space between the upper lip and the nose. I made a photo stamp copy of the sketch and sent it to uh, Constable Moran uh, and waited to hear uh, what he had to say. When I got the Polaroid picture of the composite sketch, it didn't look like anybody in particular that we had looked at. Nothing. They didn't know who it was. I was devastated. I was felt so like I was on, and he didn't know who my face was. I was just totally devastated. It looks like another dead end, but Moran is not willing to give up just yet. He sends the psychic a stack of photos, including the photo of Ron Newman. I didn't really recognize anyone in the lineup. I felt terrible, but I had to tell him, I'm having trouble recognizing the face I see. At that point, I was, I was somewhat disappointed, but uh, I knew that, that uh, there was no point in, in, uh, in pursuing something that wasn't there. But before the cop gives up on the psychic, he has one more question. Will we uh, get him and, and uh, when, when will we arrest him? And I said, yes, he's going to be 32 years old. He's going to have a mustache. And I saw the initial R. I didn't know if it was first or last name, but I saw R. Moran is stumped by Noreen's clues. Ron Newman was 32 years old, and he had the letter R in his name. But the psychic sketch looks nothing like him. The description that she made, really, it was a stretch to make it fit Newman. The last conversation I had with Constable Moran was when he sent me the lineup of the faces, and that was the last time we spoke. At that point, the, uh, the case uh, didn't go very much further. I was taken from the case and put back on general duties uh, because there was no other avenues of investigation to, uh, to pursue. I questioned my ability. How could I see so clearly and it be so wrong? What was wrong? What, my mind, what was happening? The case goes cold. Two 16-year-olds are dead, and their killer is still out there. Police run occasional Crime Stoppers television spots, but no new leads surface. It always seemed like they were at a dead end, and that really, in, in the public's mind, it was going to be sort of a miracle if anybody was caught because so much time had elapsed. In fact, 13 years go by. Then, science steps in and reignites a cold case and confirms a psychic's long-forgotten vision. How could I be so wrong when I had seen so clearly? In Thunder Bay, Ontario, the murder of two teenage girls remains unsolved. Thirteen years pass, and then a breakthrough in fingerprinting technology offers new hope to cold cases. In August of 2000, an automated fingerprint identification system known as APHIS was upgraded to search and retrieve both finger and palm prints of convicted felons. This led to numerous cases uh, being cleared up, uh, and one of them was the Tevin M. LeClaire case. Partial prints found on a beer bottle and a plastic bag at the scenes could now be compared against pools of fingerprint records. APHIS turns up a hit, and the owner of the prints is Larry Runholm. In 1990, three years after the murders, Larry Runholm, a native of Thunder Bay, had been arrested and charged with drinking and driving. His fingerprints were forwarded to the RCMP and remained on file for 10 years, until the new technology made the match. A case that has baffled cops for 13 years is finally solved. On July 11, 2000, Runholm is charged with the murders of Donna Tevenham and Bernadette LeClaire. It was a huge story when, when he was arrested uh, because the community had almost forgotten about these deaths and, and the few people that still remember it had almost given up any hope that anyone would ever be arrested and held to account for it. 
The arrest finally vindicated a psychic who 13 years earlier accurately described both girls, their dark hair, Donna's braces, and Bernadette's feisty personality. She even envisioned their deaths. I'm having trouble breathing. But it was her sketch of the killer that police turned a blind eye to years ago that now came back to haunt them. The profile provided by Noreen Rainier uh, regarding a suspect uh, turned out it uh, was, uh, was amazingly accurate. At the time of the murders, uh, Mr. Ronholm was only 19. We have a high school photograph, uh, Mr. Ronholm. The uh, prominent nose, the full mouth, the uh, length of the hair. Other puzzling clues offered by the psychic now seemed to make sense as well. I remember uh, Constable Moran saying, will we get him and when will we arrest him? And I said, yes, he's going to be 32 years old. He's going to have a mustache. And I saw the initial R. I didn't know if it was first or last name, but I saw R. So I was overjoyed that my information was right. Sad that it didn't help in a timely manner. Run home admits to intentionally killing both girls and avoids a jury trial by pleading guilty to second degree murder. And Larry Runholm never took the stand never explained anything. His lawyer said he's, he, he has no memory of what happened, so he has nothing to offer. Runholm claims he can't remember what happened back in 1987 when the girls, both 16, were believed to have been raped and then suffocated three months apart. But Justice Stanley Carisco, in his sentencing address, says he saw no evidence of amnesia, and he says the families deserve an explanation for these sickening murders. You know, the guy is a, uh, a vicious killer, um, sadistic, and uh, uh, the judge saw through him, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. To this day, the police don't know exactly what happened the nights the two girls went missing. What they do know is that both girls were suffocated with a plastic bag. DNA testing of semen taken from both girls matched Larry Runholm, and blue paint chips found on both girls matched the paint and make of the truck he drove. Why did he do it? And, and how could he live with himself for the next 15 years, where ostensibly he was raising a family and leading a normal life. It's one of those just baffling things that you constantly think about and say, you know, what, what really happened? His plea of second degree murder carries an automatic life sentence. The ruling of 20 years came as some satisfaction and closure for the families of the victims. Second degree murder for, for, two, for two girls I would have liked to have seen you know, 22, if not a little bit more. Um, but I am pleased it's over. There was a certain amount of un uncertainty that we had uh, stepping in here today and, and uh, just wondering where the judge was going to end up. So at 20 years, I, 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 think, um, I think my sister was well served. Look at that, how many lives he's destroyed. I don't think he got what he deserves. But I know he'll get what he deserves, where he's going. If the police had used the psychic sketch in their investigation, would the murders have been solved sooner? An article published a few weeks after Runholm's arrest revealed that police did have him in their sights, but he was somehow overlooked. He had lived on a road with his parents, and his parents were away all summer at a tourist camp, which they ran. And so he had the run of the house, came and went as he pleased. His house was on the same route that myself and my partner did a door-to-door -door knock on. And as it happens that the one side of the road that my partner was on was the same house that Mr. Runholm lived in. And he wasn't home the, the two times we went there. But we had, at that point, we had no reason to suspect Mr. Runholm of anything. He was just another name to be cleared. The police just using me is right, but they are not used to working with psychics, so they don't understand how we work and how they have to interpret our clues. It's not all factual the way in this reality. My goal, and still will be till it happens, is to train and teach the detectives how to do what I can do. In, uh, in hindsight, the clues that Ms. Rainier provided, although we were disappointed uh, that we weren't able to successfully charge suspect number one, uh, it, it did prove to be very accurate for suspect number two, uh, although 13 years down the road. I'm glad I used the psychic because it uh, 
sort of opens up uh, a whole new avenue of investigation. We had nothing to lose by, by using her and everything to gain. How dare I had doubted my own psychic ability. Uh, so, yes, I was joyful uh, and knowing that my ability was working and does work. And again, like fate, don't doubt, believe. A lazy summer day at the lake turns to panic. I said, where's Tom? When a five-year-old boy disappears. I wondered if he was dead. Police think he's drowned, but a local psychic says he's lost in the forest. I could see this little boy lying under a very large tree. Is the psychic right? Is Tommy Kennedy alive or dead? Empire Lake in picturesque upstate New York, a favorite spot to spend a summer afternoon, especially in the mid-70s. It was a place where people could go and relax or bring their picnic lunches and have a nice time. But for Mary Kennedy, Empire Lake brings back memories of a day she will never forget. On a hot summer day in 1975, Mary Kennedy and her family head to Empire Lake to spend the day swimming. My fiancé and his two daughters, Siri and Lisa, and my two sons, Ben and Tom, we decided to go down to the lake and give the children a chance to cool off. After swimming, Fred takes the kids for a nature walk. It was all four of the children. I really don't remember why I didn't go. Fred and the kids disappear into the woods. While everyone was hiking, I was lying on the blanket, enjoying the day, knowing me, I probably had a book with me. But that enjoyment was about to end. I see Fred and the children coming towards me. Everybody was sweaty and happy and I don't see Tom. Tommy is Mary's youngest son. He's five years old. I felt a moment of panic. Fred comes up to me and I say, where's Tom? And Fred says, I sent him back to you. Fred says Tom wasn't wearing shoes and he complained his feet were hurting. I sent him back to you just at the, at the beginning of our trip. He was whiny and didn't seem to want to do the walk, and so I sent him back to you. He thought that Tom was more competent than he was. I would not have done that. Oh, my god. Where is my child? I remember just jumping up and starting to run around the lake, screaming for him. They search frantically, backtracking their walk. Perhaps he's just hiding. He was like a little imp, liked to play tricks on people. They were always busy doing something, building tree houses, exploring the fields. He was delightful. But after two hours, no sign of Tommy. To add to their concern, a thunderstorm is moving in. They realize it's time to call the police. By the time I arrived, Tommy had probably been missing two or three hours. It was probably somewhere around four or five o'clock by that time. Dave Redsiger was a member of the local emergency squad in Spencer. What we did was contacted all the surrounding uh, fire departments. I remember standing there and 
Seeing the emergency vehicles beginning to arrive right down on the lawn. You know, they just bypassed the parking lot and they were setting up a command center down there on the lawn. It seemed like every car had a two-way radio going. He's wearing a white t-shirt and a pair of plaid short. I remember just regular people beginning to arrive. People standing in groups and being briefed and being told where to go. Nobody seen to see him around the camp site. Uh, nobody seen him around the swim area. So you've kind of narrowed it down to two areas, the woods or the lake. I look over, and they're bringing boats in. And that only means one thing. A dive team goes into the water to search for Tommy. Near the camping area was heavily dead woods, a lot of stumps, uh, things that, you know, if somebody got in there, they could very easily get entangled underneath the water and not be able to uh, get back to the surface. And I was just horrified. I was absolutely horrified. And I just wouldn't look at them. Absolutely didn't want to look at them. The dive team searches the perimeter of the lake, but no sign of Tommy. The storm is getting worse. Once the weather started to get bad and the lightning started getting pretty nasty, we had to call off the water search. Four hours had passed since five-year-old Tom went missing. And by that time, it was pouring. It was just torrential. And I'm thinking about this little five-year-old kid with a bathing suit on out there in the cold rain in the woods somewhere. And I'm just so scared for him. Eight miles away, in the town of Spencer, 25-year-old psychic Phil Jordan hears the news. I ran across the backyard, and my landlord was standing in the back door. And she said a little boy was missing up at Empire Lake. She says they think he's in the lake and that he is drowned. But out of nowhere, the psychic has a vision. He can see little Tommy. I could see this little boy lying under a very large tree. That showed me that he was probably in the woods and probably not in the lake. Is Tommy Kennedy still alive, lost in the woods? Is the psychic right? And will anyone listen? In upstate New York, a massive search is underway at Empire Lake for five-year-old Tommy Kennedy, who vanished during a family picnic. This little five-year-old kid Tommy! out there in the cold rain. And I'm just so scared for him. The storm gets worse, and day turns to night. We really started getting some nasty storm weather coming in, and it blew in quite heavy. A lot of, a lot of rain. And of course, with that, we got a lot of thunder and lightning and it got quite cold. The missing boy's father, Don Kennedy, a local reporter, arrives eight hours after his son disappeared. He had been out of town, and he had rushed to the lake. Don begins frantically searching for his son, but now there's a new danger. With the lightning and the thunder, we were really afraid of ending up with you know, more searchers lost besides the boy. Red Sicker has no choice. He calls off the search. Intellectually, I understood, but my little five-year-old is out there. It's all by himself. Tommy's parents are desperate. Don Kennedy remembers a piece he'd written about a local psychic. By coincidence, it's Phil Jordan. My five-year-old child was lost. As far as I was concerned, bring in the National Guard. Bring in anyone who will help search for him and find him. I was not surprised that he called me. I felt that I might hear from some of the family. He was really pleading. He wanted me to come up to the lake at that time. The psychic says he can help to find the missing boy, but not just yet. I just knew that if I went there, I would become contaminated with everyone else's ideas and not follow my own self, my own psychic self. 
I remember saying to Don Kennedy, I'm really sorry, but I just can't come right now. I have to wait till daylight because I don't want to miss a clue that could help us to find him. With the search called off and the psychic refusing to come to the lake until daybreak, Mary Kennedy is losing hope. I'm wondering if he's cold, wondering if he's scared. I wondered if he was dead. But back in Spencer, psychic Phil Jordan is already on the case. I sometimes leaf through the Bible and just point to something. And there was a phrase, and it said something about the children uh, going into the woods. Suddenly, the psychic has a vision of exactly where to find Tommy. Although he's never been to Empire Lake, he begins to draw a map. The first thing I knew was that down to my left, there would be three boats. And then I could see the building across the lake. And I knew I would have to go into the woods behind the building till we find a clearing. So I drew that all on the map. But can this crudely drawn map lead to Tommy Kennedy? It's 5 a.m. The storm is over. Tommy Kennedy has been missing an agonizing 16 hours. No parent should have to spend a night like that. I don't remember whether we ate supper, what we said to each other. It's blank. Hundreds of volunteers from miles around gather at dawn to resume the search. There were several fire trucks with personnel on them, at least one ambulance. We got the people together, told them what the boy's name was, and then had them search areas around the lake into the wooded areas, but we concentrated on the area immediately around the camping area and the bathing, uh, swimming area. I was just tremendously grateful that all these people just showed up. Psychic Phil Jordan also arrives at the lake to help with the search. I met Dave Redsicker, who was a friend of mine, but was the investigator in charge. Even I says, well, I have this map. I was shocked. As simple as the map was, the things that he had drawn on the map were right there. The three boats were there, exactly as I had drawn. And across, you could see a large tent. And I said, that has to be the building. We'll go in behind the tent. But the searchers think he's wrong. And what he was describing was an area that we hadn't searched yet, because it was an area that we figured was the most remote area or most unlikely area that this child would have gotten into. But the psychic is confident his map will lead to the lost boy. Before he begins his search, the psychic makes an unusual request. He asked me for an article of clothing that belonged to Tom. So I asked Phil Jordan if one of his little sneakers would be OK. And Phil said, absolutely. His mom made sure I had that sneaker. And I tucked that into my belt, and I focused on Tommy Kennedy and finding him. 250 rescuers search the south side of Empire Lake, the area closest to the spot where Tommy was last seen. Meanwhile, Phil Jordan and two volunteers, armed only with a psychic map and a little boy's shoe, head in the opposite direction. There was myself and these two men that I didn't know. I just wished them good luck, and they headed out into the woods. 25-year-old Phil Jordan has never tested his psychic powers in a life-and-death situation before, and he's never been to Empire Lake. But he has faith in his map. I know we're going to find him, and we will find him within an hour. Honey! Every little ways, I would stop, and I'd say to myself, OK, we have to keep going straight. Now we have to turn left. Tommy! Now we have to go up here. We have to go a little bit to the right. And I remember talking to myself through the whole thing so I could block out any of the ideas that others had. It was rugged terrain. There was a hiking path, but it was uphill. A lot of woods, a lot of trees falling across the, the path and treacherous going. Is it possible that a five-year-old without shoes could have strayed so far? 
The psychic is now deep in the woods. Two miles from where Tommy Kennedy disappeared. And so far, the psychic has turned up nothing. And now, one of the two men with him is starting to have doubts. One of them kept saying, everything you're describing is in another direction. Yet hundreds of volunteers searching in the area where he should be can't find a trace of Tommy either. Nothing. It was as if Tom had just vanished. The psychic struggles to keep his vision. And that's when I would refer to the map and hold on to his sneaker and say, Tommy, I'm coming, I'm going to find you. But now even the psychic starts to doubt his map. I was already to say, well, maybe we should check that other area and come back here later today. And then Phil Jordan makes a startling discovery. <laughs> On the shores of Empire Lake in upstate New York, Mary Kennedy waits desperately for any news of her five-year-old son, Tommy, who's been missing for over 16 hours. It was as if Tom had just vanished. Hundreds of searchers comb the area around the lake where the boy disappeared, but with no luck. Yet two miles away, psychic Phil Jordan, following his crude map, has stumbled across a child's footprint. It was right in front of me. I looked at that footprint and I thought, oh, we must be close, and I got goosebumps, you know. That footprint convinces the psychic he's on the right track. I said to the other searchers, now we have to find a clearing. It shouldn't be too far up here. So we continued on, and within moments, we found the clearing. I just stood at the opening of the clearing and said to myself, OK, now which way do I have to go? I looked at it sort of as a clock, and I thought, we've got to go where the 11 is. And we went to that area, and there was another path through the woods. As he climbs a gully, Phil falls behind the other searchers, but he can still hear them calling out Tommy's name. And then? An answer. Help me! I'm over here! I woke up to the sound of uh, people calling my name. Tommy! Tommy Kennedy! I started screaming, I'm over here, I'm over here. The fellow who tried to talk me into going in the other direction, he says, I hear him yelling. He's yelling for help. help me! And so they all ran in the direction that the voice came I'm from. Here! I saw these men coming towards me with huge smiles on their face. I was very relieved that they had found me. Everybody was giving Phil Jordan congratulations. I could tell right away that he was the one that was responsible for, for locating me. I just dropped there and knelt there and thanked God that he had given me this ability and cried. You know, I just sobbed. It was, it was very emotional. He was worried that he had done wrong. He was worried that he was going to be reprimanded. And it was quite the opposite. Everybody was so thankful. Tommy Kennedy had been missing more than 16 hours. One of the searchers reminds Phil about a prediction he had made. He says, 58 minutes. And I says, what does that mean? And he says, you told me we'd find him within an hour, and it was 58 minutes after we started. Tommy's rescuers carry him out to a nearby road. They had walkie-talkies, and they radioed for help. And soon the ambulance came to a road that was not far from where Tommy actually was and the news that Tommy is safe is radioed back to the lake. Someone comes up to me and tells me that Tom has been found. It's like heaven opened up. I was just so grateful. Then almost instantly, there he is. After almost two days of anguish, mother and son are reunited. He says, I was camping, Mom. I slept next to a stick. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that he's found, and it's a miracle that he's OK. Phil Jordan's visions had been right from the beginning. Tommy Kennedy hadn't gone near the lake. Instead, he had wandered deep into the forest. I immediately started crying and whining as I was walking back. And I'm sure that contributed to me getting lost. I, 
probably wasn't paying attention to the marks on the path. I just started running in circles, and within a very short period of time, the clouds rolled in. And that first lightning bolt came down. Then I was terrified, and I started running and running and running. Wet, scared, and exhausted, he remembered what his mother had taught him. I taught my children standard safety, which is you don't go near the water when there's lightning. Find a, a sheltered place. I came upon a sort of a clearing, and uh, I found a nice large stick to uh, fend off any attacking animals. Phil had marked just such a clearing on his map. I was completely exhausted by that time, so I, I didn't have any trouble at all falling asleep. How could a psychic with a crudely drawn map succeed where 250 rescuers failed? If it hadn't been for Phil you know, and his map and his abilities, we either wouldn't have found him for a long time or we may not have found him at all. I'm certain that Phil Jordan saved Tom's life. Word that Phil Jordan had found a lost boy using his psychic abilities is big news. Even the local sheriff, who is not in the habit of using the paranormal, recognizes his achievement. And he says, I would like you to become deputized so that if we have other cases, you can work more freely with law enforcement. So help me God. At that time, Phil was the only deputized psychic that I was aware of in New York State. Phil Jordan's amazing accomplishment at Empire Lake paved the way for psychics all over America to team up with police in solving difficult cases. It was truly an honor to be deputized because at that time in history, psychics were just beginning to be used a little bit in police work. It's now 32 years since psychic Phil Jordan found little Tommy Kennedy lost in the woods. They haven't seen each other since. <laughs> until today. <laughs> Good to see you. Well, Phil still has the shoe that helped him to find Tommy so long ago. <laughs> I, I put it in my belt and I'd say, OK, Tommy, tell me where you are. Do you remember that day? I do. I remember running through the woods. I remember the lightning. I remember finding a stick to sleep with. See, I remember. Wild bear. Exactly. Yeah, like <laughs> like my five-year-old with a stick is going to do something that's to right, a bear. That's right. But uh, <laughs> ah, while you were using your head, yeah. that's the best way you knew how. Right. Happen. Yeah. And the next thing I remember is hearing you guys. You know, I heard you calling for me and waking up. It was that day that I proved my ability to myself, and from then on, no one's ever convinced me that I can't do what I do. Without him, they might have been looking for my bones, you know? <laughs> when a 42-year-old nurse is found bludgeoned to death, a small town in New Jersey is in shock. It was a vicious attack. Her hands were bound with an extension cord. A minimum of 21 hits in the head. I didn't have my mother to raise me anymore. Police suspect her boyfriend, but a psychic says the killer is someone else. I saw a man, saw a hammer, a tied-up woman in her bed. Can a psychic's vision solve the mystery of who killed Betty Cornish? The killer lives upstairs. Belvedere, New Jersey, an hour away from New York City, but a million miles away from big city crime, a town where neighbors trust each other and doors are seldom locked. It's a very quiet town. Everybody knows everyone. It's just one of those small communities. Basically, a little rural town that hadn't really changed over the decades. Until August 8th, 1987. A frantic emergency call comes in from a man who says he's found his girlfriend dead. Kent Swigert, now chief of Belvedere Police, is the first on the scene. I entered the apartment and observed a male standing in the living room. And this male said to me, is she dead? So I walked into the bedroom and I observed a female lying face up in the bed. It was pretty obvious that she was killed. The crime is so horrific that the Belvedere Police need help. Dave Heater of the Warren County Prosecutor's Office is assigned to the case. 
It was a vicious attack. We had a minimum of 21 hits in the head. There was blood spattered 360 degrees on all four walls, the ceiling. There was blood pulled on the floor. She was laying face up. Her arms were behind her back. Her hands were bound with an extension cord. Her nightshirt was pulled up over her head. Totally blood soaked along with the sheet around her, about her head that was also blood soaked. There was exposed bone and extreme, extreme damage to the forehead. The victim is 42-year-old Betty Cornish, a divorced mother with five grown daughters. She worked as a practical nurse. She was a good mom. She liked to go out dancing, and she had a big circle of friends that she would go out with. She had recently moved back to Belvedere to be closer to her family. It was something I just couldn't believe. I was like, what do you mean, you know? What do you mean my sister's dead? So vicious was the attack that at first police think she was killed by gunfire. My sister Mary Beth called. She just said something happened and that they thought she was shot. And I know I, I started going crazy that I wanted to go with her because I knew they were going to take her body to Newark for an autopsy. And I just kept saying, she's going to be alone, she's going to be alone, I want to be with her. The autopsy report shows that Betty Cornish died of blunt force injuries consistent with a hammer attack. When we started to find out from the autopsy reports that the claw end of the hammer was used and that it penetrated into the skull, it was gruesome. This was an angry person. Whether it came as a result of a fight, whether the victim had fought with him, he was mad, angry at something, and he took it out on the victim. The murder was so violent that the police assume Betty's neighbors must have heard something. We're having a very difficult time. We're not getting anyone within the apartment complex that's giving us anything. There were no screams. There was nothing out of the ordinary, nothing unusual. And apart from the vicious attack to the victim, there is nothing unusual in the apartment except for blood in the bathroom. We found blood in the bathroom, and we found blood around the sink and also on the mirrors. We had made the assumption that our suspect had probably cleaned up there. At first, it looks as if the killer came through the window because the victim's window was removed and found leaning against the building. But a fingerprint found on the glass tells the police a very different story. That fingerprint would have had to have been someone from the inside grabbing the window. The idea that if someone did jump in, they would have to grab a hold of the sill in order to pull themselves in. There would have had to been striations across that wooden sill from the body sliding across there were no striations. That leads police to believe Betty Cornish knew her killer. We believe that that window was removed to draw us off because he was located so close to the victim. So the police zero in on her boyfriend. He found the body. He reported the crime. When we began to question him, he indicated that he had been out fishing that day. Some of the other investigators who were going around the apartment came into us to tell us that they found a set of clippers that a fisherman would typically use was located directly below the bedroom window of the victim. That became very suspicious to us because he said he had been fishing. It was shocking, but I kind of thought that maybe it was the boyfriend because I didn't know Paul that, that well. Could he be the one who removed the window? We started questioning her boyfriend more and more, and honestly, I believe he got scared. Before police can further question him, he stops talking. He asked for an attorney at the time. So we couldn't talk to him any further, and his attorney advised him not to speak with us or cooperate with us at any point. Now, after three days and no hard leads, the people in town are uneasy. This was the first murder that Belvedere had experienced in really 80 to 100 years. The people in the immediate area of Blair House Apartments were, were very, very scared at the time. There was a, a crowd of people that had watched what was going on, and there was fear that there might be more people in danger. Everything, my whole complete life changed overnight. I didn't have a place to live anymore. I didn't have my mother to raise me anymore. Nothing's ever normal again. Residents in the apartment complex, eager to help the police, volunteer for polygraph tests, and they all pass. It seems as if the police have hit a wall. 
The longer that a case goes on, your chances lessen greatly by the hour. It starts to scare you. There is a killer in the community, and you don't know where he is. You imagine a monster. Only a monster could do something like that, and that's what we were afraid of. What kind of crazy person that could be out there? I just wanted this person caught yesterday, you know? I remember calling the prosecutor's office. Did they find him yet? Did they find this person that killed my sister yet? That's when someone had told me about Nancy. Nancy Weber is a psychic who claims to be able to see what most of us cannot. It's not always in picture form. Sometimes it's sound, sometimes it's smells, sometimes it's vision, sometimes it's a feel of fabric. Eight days after her sister's murder, Peggy calls psychic Nancy Weber and sets up a meeting. And she didn't want to know anything. Nancy didn't want to know anything. And she took me into this room, and we began to talk. I felt this horrible, heartbreaking misery. Without any knowledge of the case, the psychic claims to tune in to Peggy's loss. Somehow that connected inside me with she had sustained a great and tragic loss of a family member. She had a sister who was murdered. And then she says something amazing. I said to her that the chief suspect is a boyfriend. She said, yes. I said, he is not the killer. But can the psychic see who the real killer is? I saw a hammer. I saw a tied up woman in her bed. I saw her brutally murdered. And I thought, that's the killer. In Belvedere, New Jersey, it's been eight days since 42-year-old Betty Cornish was found bludgeoned to death in her bed. There is a killer in the community, and you don't know where he is. Her boyfriend, who found the body, isn't talking, and the police have few hard leads. I just wanted this person caught yesterday, you know. Desperate to find the killer, the victim's sister asks a psychic for help, and the psychic has a vision of the murder, a vision so horrific, she feels she can only share it with the police. I asked her to please contact the police involved. I said, let them speak with me, not you. I received a call from uh, Peggy Goebel. She told me that she had been talking to a woman who was a psychic. I'm skeptical. You know, when a psychic calls up or says, says that they have psychic ability, I want to hear who it is and what they have to say before I'm going to put a lot of faith into that individual. But in this case, it's Nancy Weber. So I said, OK, now I'm listening. The detective and the psychic have worked together before on other cases. I would be more than happy to bring her to the scene and get her thoughts, her feelings on, on what occurred here, because we're now beginning to get into a week into this case, and we're getting nowhere. No sooner did the detective and the psychic arrive at the scene than Nancy has a vision that will turn the investigation upside down. I looked upstairs, and I saw a shadow, and I thought, that's the killer. He was going upstairs. He lives there. I pointed upstairs and said, the killer lives upstairs. I said, his first name's John, and the last initial R. She gave me the name John, and she gave me the initials JR. The man upstairs is 30-year-old John Reese, a farm laborer who lives with his girlfriend and her two children. He operated a piece of heavy equipment at the sod farm, just a working class individual. And I said, well, I'm not real sure it's, that's the right guy, Nancy. He already passed a polygraph. Not only has John Reese passed a polygraph, but he has an alibi for the time police think Betty was murdered. Based on what the condition of the body and what we knew at that time, we were guessing that the time of death would have been somewhere around midnight. John Reese was able to tell us pretty specifically where he was during the entire day, right up until the point of about 2 o'clock in the morning, and at that point, he went to bed. He alibied himself pretty well. I said, that doesn't matter. It was such a strong feeling and strong vision. At that point, in my mind, I was beyond Mr. Reese. He passed a polygraph. She said that she didn't care, that, you know, polygraph him again, do what you have to do, but he's, he's the guy. Next, Detective Heater takes the psychic inside Betty Cornish's bedroom. Crime scene hadn't been cleaned up. There was still blood spattered around. It was scary to walk in and not know what lay there. 
As Nancy stands beside the victim's bed, she is hit with another vision. Ben, I got the time of about 1.30 a.m. roughly. Her vision puts the time of death much later than what the police say. And this was one of the few times Dave actually responded to me and said, no, it was earlier. I said, no, wrong, because I had a very strong impression of a time. And I had a very strong impression of a murderer. Could the psychic be right? Could the killer be John Reese? She made me think more. Like, I knew he was a suspect, but I was a suspect. Everybody was. So when she kept pushing it is when I started to believe it. They he found it. Passed the polygraph. She knew that he still did it. He was there when the police arrived. He was there when the detectives arrived. He was there when they removed the body. And he was... He was just there. Every time someone would look, there was John Reese. It's the psychic's final vision that turns the investigation on its head. I see this blur of a metallic buckle that I am told in my mind is a Western belt buckle that has meaning and value to John Reese. Peter sends an investigator to see if Nancy is right. Reese, in fact, had the belt buckle and was very consistent with everything that Nancy had described. With this new piece of information, Detective Heater goes out on a limb and takes a second look at the man upstairs. I, as a supervisor, at least now at this point, had some kind of justification in my own mind for spending man hours on a man who already passed a polygraph. He decides to take a gamble on a psychic's vision. My boss basically told me I was crazy. Heater sends detectives to question Reese again. Reese was very comfortable with these two detectives and was willing to talk to them. Every day, they became almost like friends. And because of that investigative bond, Reese started talking about more things. Detective Tom Trainer was one of the officers investigating Reese. He gave information that caused us to believe that he might have been in the victim's apartment. It wasn't a real credible account of how or why he was in there. And of course, uh, meanwhile, one of our ID men had developed you know, the latent prints off the front window. 11 days after the murder, the first solid piece of damning evidence, the fingerprint belongs to John Reese. Trainer went after Reese again and told him, look, we've got your fingerprint on the window. What's the story? Oh, well. You know, we're friends, Betty and I. I. I would come down there, and, you know, the window would get stuck. So, you know, I would help her un, unjam the window to get it closed. John Reese said that he was there to fix the window, and the window never got stuck. We had to put a stick underneath it to hold it up because it wouldn't stay stuck. Another break. The medical examiner revises the time of death. Betty Cornish didn't die at midnight, as the police thought. She died much later. We got results back from the medical examiner's office, which gave us a time of death more into the early morning hours. Just as the psychic told police at a time when Reese has no alibi. The biggest problem that we had was the time period in the 3 o'clock to 3.30 in the morning area. We felt that there was something he was holding back. We had his fingerprint from inside the apartment. We knew that he was lying to us at this point in time. But the police have to make a case that will stand up in court. They need the murder weapon. Can the psychic help? I saw a swamp, and so I told them, this is where you'll find the hammer. Thanks to a psychic's vision, police in Belvedere, New Jersey, now have a prime suspect in the brutal killing of a 42-year-old nurse. I pointed upstairs and said, the killer lives upstairs. But they don't have enough hard evidence to arrest him. They need the murder weapon, and the psychic claims she knows where it is. Suddenly saw this small body of messy, muddy water and the hammer falling into it. I thought, he dropped it in there. Nancy, when she returned to our office, she drew us a map took a piece of paper and drew my crude map and handed it to them and said, this is where you'll find the hammer. She gave us a road. She gave us a patch that she said were woods. And she said, and over in this corner, 
is water. And she said, I see Reese throwing the hammer into the woods. But she can't tell the police where that water is located. At the same time, detectives continue to badger their prime suspect, determined to find cracks in his story. He was able to give detailed information about, you know, when he made the coffee, when he got up in the morning to go to work, and what time he left for work. But then the time when we felt that the victim was murdered was a time that he, he didn't recall. He just breezed right over it. Reese started talking about more things. And those things that he kept adding into his statement during the times was, was things that were off, that were not talked about before. There's a lot of little things that, are, that he changes in his behavior between, you know, deep breaths. Or you could tell something was, is bothering him. Um, and we just felt at that point that he was ready to tell us something. Detectives make their move. They bring Reese in. We hit him with all the things that we knew walked around the table, sat down next to him, looked him in the eye, and said, John, we know you did it, and you know you did it. Now, why don't you tell us about it? Approximately 20 to 25 minutes, perhaps half an hour later, Detective Trainer came out of that room and advised us that he had confessed to the murder. I believe he knew that we knew that he was the killer, and for some reason, he had to share that with us. It's hard to picture why or how, but something made him realized that, you know, it was wrong and that he had to trust us and that he did it and he had to admit that. There was a camera on the floor that I picked up and I hit her once in the head with it. I hit her two, three, four times with the hammer. Large amount of blood flow. On the bed, some on the walls. And I went upstairs. Later, he told the police he dumped the hammer at the farm where he works. When we did the search through the woods and we came out, there was the water in front of us. Water where Nancy said there would be water. We went in, we recovered the hammer, photographed it, brought it out, bagged it, tagged it, and put it into evidence. 18 days after beating Betty Cornish to death, John Reese is charged with her murder. And I remember just my mother and father and I embracing and jumping up and down, happy that they caught him, um, but realizing that it just wouldn't bring her back. Despite the confession, Reese later pleads not guilty. At the trial, his lawyers suggest Betty Cornish invited Reese into her apartment. It was very hard because we would have to sit and see the murderer there every day. A lot of the time, Mr. Reese basically propped his, his head on his hand and, and just seemed somewhat disinterested for the most part. He didn't want to show any expression to the jury, so he just basically sat like he was bored. And he would, you know, constantly turn his head and look at us. I remember my mother being there, and she was crying. You know, it was hard for her to hold back her cries, and they wanted to put her out of the room. They didn't want the jurors to see my mother crying because it would sway their decision. The jury doesn't believe John Reese's story. What they do believe is that sometime around 3 a.m., Reese came downstairs and snuck into Betty Cornish's apartment, bound her wrists with an extension cord, sexually assaulted her, and beat her to death, striking her at least 21 times with a hammer. After a five-week trial, Reese is found guilty of all 11 charges, including first-degree murder. He is sentenced to 110 years. I would like him to say he was sorry. I would like him to show some remorse, because he never has. I think that if he were to say anything, that he would try to hurt us in some way, because he is sick enough. He got two life sentences. He's eligible for parole in 45 years. So that means that he will be 72. Or when, dead. Or dead. And we will fight so that he dies in prison. Why was the psychic so convinced that it was the man upstairs who killed Betty Cornish? He had already passed a lie detector test, yet she remained adamant her vision was correct. She knew his initials were JR, and his first name was John. 
She also knew that he wore a large, Western-style belt buckle. She even directed the police toward the murder weapon. Nancy was probably one of the driving forces that kept me going back to Reese. I was willing to give him up, but she was very insistent. Any constructive thing I can do assists Elizabeth and her soul and assists her family. And whether you want to call it spiritual matter, whatever it is that a psychic sees, you've got to be able to believe in it. There's science, there may be the supernatural. I don't know how to explain what a psychic does, how they do it. All I know is it works. When a woman's body washes up on a Florida beach, no one is more shocked than the police. I have never in my life seen anything like this before. The Navy thinks her husband's best friend is the killer, but a psychic disagrees. The man's innocent. How many times can you say, I, it wasn't me, I didn't do anything? A psychic connects with the dead. He's going to kill me. Will her message be enough to save an innocent man from life in prison? On the northeast coast of Florida, Jacksonville is home to the Mayport Naval Station, the third largest U.S. naval base in the world. We live in a large military town, and uh, we had two aircraft carriers, and you could tell when they were out to sea, that was 10,000 people gone from your population. On the morning of March 26, 1988, two fishermen make a grisly discovery. They find a body washed up on the intercoastal waterway. They thought it was a dolphin. They thought it was a fish that had washed up on the beach. Dave Archer is a detective with the Atlantic Beach Police. When he arrives at the scene, he immediately knows this is no simple drowning. I could tell it was that of a white female. Her hands were tied behind her back with a fishing stringer. And I thought, OK, that's odd. She's identified as 22-year-old Anita Lukander. She had been reported missing by her co-workers at the Navy base nine days earlier. She was in my duty section, and she didn't show up for work. And in the Navy, you show up for work. Peter Johnstone was a co-worker and a close friend of the Lukanders. When he'd realized Anita was missing, and knowing her husband was away at sea, he and fellow workers began a citywide search. I mean, everybody, you know, we all gotten worried. I mean, even the Navy had gotten hold of her husband, Bill, who was, I believe, down in Guantanamo Bay at the time. My chief brought me down to the chief's mess and actually spent about four hours with me talking and uh, settling me down, and it, uh, I won't forget that night. The autopsy suggests Anita's body had been in the water for nine days. She was gagged with a white T-shirt. She had been strangled, and her body had been mutilated. I said, do you think she was raped? And he said, I can't tell. I said, what do you mean you can't tell? He said, all that's been surgically removed. And I thought, what? The medical examiner also notes that her left ear had been cut off. I told my boss, I said, look, I am entirely out of my league on this one. I have never in my life seen anything like this before. Because of the shocking nature of the crime, they call in both state and federal law enforcement agencies, including the FBI. And Atlantic Beach at the time was a small town, a small police force. I don't think they were used to homicide investigations. And honestly, I don't think it was really taken seriously until uh, Anita's body was found. When investigators initially searched the Lukander home, the front door was unlocked. There was no sign of forced entry. It just looked like a normal apartment. I'm thinking we got another missing military wife. You know, she's probably took off with somebody or who knows. Three days later, Anita's truck was found parked at a local bar just four miles from the house. When Bill Lukander arrives home from sea, he notices right away that something is wrong. Some of his guns are missing from his cabinet. Police immediately check pawn shops in the area, and one dealer says someone tried to sell him the stolen guns. A composite sketch of the suspect is made, but it leads nowhere and is filed away. 
We started out with everybody was a suspect. In fact, the insurance company called me and said, we're fixing the payoff on the Lukander case, but we want to know if the husband is a suspect, because if he is, we're not going to pay. And I told him, I said, lady, at this point, he's the only one that's not a suspect. And the reason he's not is because he was out of the country. A month later, a bizarre discovery. A mailman finds Anita's wallet. Sitting on top of it, a cold glass of water. No fingerprints are found on the wallet or the glass. We took that as like a, a sign saying, OK, you guys, are, you guys are getting cold. You're headed in the wrong direction. You need to go back the other way. The next day, Anita's purse is discovered blocks away from the Lukander home and on the same street as Bill's best friend, Peter Johnstone. Friends say that Johnstone spent a lot of time at the Lukander home, especially when his good friend Bill was away at sea. Well, when Bill was gone, yeah, I would hang out over there. It wasn't as, not hardly as much as I did when Bill was there. To investigators, Johnstone is beginning to look suspicious. Every time you turn around, bam, Peter, Peter Johnstone is standing right there looking at you. How's it going, guys? Is there anything I, I could do for you? No, we're, we're on an active homicide investigation right now. There's nothing you can do for us, unless you did it. Peter takes two polygraph tests. The first is inconclusive. The second one, he passes. I never felt concerned that they were investigating me. I never felt concerned with that. Always, anything I could do to help. Peter remains a suspect, but with no new witnesses, no physical evidence, the police don't have enough to make a case. Everything was circumstantial. There was no smoking gun. There was no fingerprint to say, this is this and this is that. You just couldn't do it. Nine months after Anita was murdered, police are still no closer to catching her killer. We had pretty much hit a, a dead end. The Anita Lukander case goes cold. Seven years pass without a single lead, and Anita's brutal killer is still out there. Between 1988 and 1995, I was very frustrated, angry. I was still basically living and working with the same group of folks and pretty much realized that, you know, there was probably somebody in that group that had killed Anita. Then, in 1995, the Naval Criminal Investigation Services sets up a cold case unit, and the Anita Lukander case starts to warm up again. They go back to the original suspect list from 1989. At the top is Peter Johnstone, who is now married with two children and no longer in the Navy. Two agents visit him in his home in Maryland. You know, they just want to ask me a few questions, and all oh, the case had been brought back up. And just in a split second, it turned ugly, and they said, you did it. We know you did it. You are the one, and you have, you better tell us now. And, and once again, I was just flabbergasted. Investigators grilled Johnstone for a full three days. Now, in a dramatic turnaround, they believe they have the evidence they need to nail him. He's taken into custody and held for 30 days until the Florida Duval County Grand Jury indicts the former Navy Squadron member for the murder of Anita Lukander. Mimi Hannon, an investigator for the Public Defender's Office, is assigned the case. We had a man that probably didn't commit this homicide, and it was our job to prove that. For the defense, seven years after the murder, it was going to be tough going. So breaking with convention, they turned to a psychic for help. But could a psychic's cryptic clues help save Peter Johnstone from life in prison? It's been seven years since Anita Lukander's mutilated body washed up on the intercoastal waterway in Jacksonville, Florida. Her co-worker, former Navy Petty Officer Peter Johnstone, is charged with murdering his best friend's wife. How many times can you say, I, it wasn't me, I didn't do anything? There was no physical evidence really linking Peter to the crime. Uh, the only thing that linked him to Anita Lukander was his friendship with her, his uh, business acquaintanceship with her, and, uh, you know, his friendship with her husband. Anne Finnell and Pat McGinnis are Peter Johnstone's public defense lawyers. Perhaps Peter Johnstone was an easy person to focus in on because he co was cooperative with them. The most damning evidence the Navy had was a supposed verbal confession given by Peter Johnstone during their three-day interrogation of him in Maryland. After I was arrested, I spent 30 days in um, Maryland jail. 
awaiting paperwork from Florida because I was arrested under a fugitive, for, fugitive from justice for murder. And uh, when I got to Florida is when I met my attorney, uh, Pat McGinnis, and they said that I had confessed. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't confess to anything. I kept telling them no for two and a half days. And apparently they had this whole confession that they wrote up. Nothing I wrote up, nothing I signed, nothing I said, no, nothing. The false confession that Peter ultimately gave was, um, you know, basically, if I'd have done this, here's what I would have done. Naval investigators contend that Peter Johnstone made advances to Anita, which she rejected. Angry, he strangles her, panics, and steals the guns from the cabinet to make it look like a burglary. He then dumps the guns and Anita Lukander's body off the bridge into the intercoastal waterway. Most people don't believe that anyone would ever confess to something they didn't do. Those instances where interrogations last for long periods of time, the likelihood of a false confession is, is real, is real. And in Peter Johnston's case, this went on for three days. Now it's up to the defense team to build a case for Peter Johnstone's innocence. Investigator Mimi Hannon's task is to go back seven years to the original 1988 investigation. Law enforcement in this case botched up an investigation tremendously. And it was a cold case. So you're going back and witnesses forget and people die and they move. And it's just really hard to reconstruct a real solid defense from something that had that happened so so long ago. To bolster their case, Hannon makes an unusual suggestion. It occurred to me that law enforcement utilizes psychics. The government has utilized psychics. And back in the 90s, people weren't very forthcoming about using psychics to help them solve mysteries. When I first mentioned to Pat and Ann that I had a psychic friend and I would like to run the case by her and see if she had any feedback, they were very skeptical. Patrick almost did it, I, I felt, just to humor me. Um, but I wasn't going to put my professional reputation on the line. I believed in Sharon's ability and was looking forward to using it. Sharon Johns is a psychic who lives in Gainesville, Georgia. She says her psychic ability comes from a higher being. I always pray to work from that highest level. And by doing that, the, the angels and the guides do come and stand with you because you're working in that light. I ask for extremely accurate, accurate information for those that I read for this day. When I get information, it just comes in words, just kind of quick words, or in a video, or just in kind of symbols. Hannon and the psychic are friends, but they've never worked together until now. I do all of my work over the phone because I prefer to be in my space. If I'm sitting beside a person, I have to move away from them. And um, I'm just more comfortable to do phone work. I don't care if the person lives next door. I'll say, no, call me on the phone. Because that way, my uh, energy is more clear. Sure, no when problem. Mimi calls Sharon Johns, she has no knowledge of the case and asks Mimi not to give her any. She wanted to know the victim's name and date of birth and Peter's name and date of birth. Peter and that's Johnson. all I gave her. Immediately before she could even get his name out, I said, the man's innocent. She told me that Peter would be found innocent and that the jury would come back in with an acquittal in March. When I look at different the aspects of what's going on, things just come immediately. With this case, it was just like a TV reel, you know, just taking place. Then Sharon inexplicably hones in on a curious clue. I keep getting this about a composite somewhere. And you really need um, to see if somebody can find it. How could Sharon know about the seven-year-old long-lost composite, the sketch of the man who tried to sell the stolen guns? And why does she think it's so significant? The composite had not been found yet. We had so many volumes of discovery to go through that we intentionally had to start searching through the discovery boxes. And we eventually did find it. It was there, just as she said. I came back to the office the next morning, and Pat wanted to know what the psychic said. And his eyes got big as saucers. There were views she had about the case and expressed that we were quite frankly puzzled as to how she could have arrived at those without a more intimate knowledge of the case than she had. We had Pat's attention. He was going to take her more seriously than he had. Sharon Johns was suggestive that this was, in fact, the uh, person who was Anita Lukander's killer. 
And the composite picture doesn't look anything like Peter Johnstone. When I first saw the police sketch of the composite, oh, I didn't think it, I don't think it looked like me at all. One, I think the person had hair. And uh, I haven't, uh, I'd like to show you some pictures of me back then. I haven't lost much hair since, you know, in 20 years. And not to mention, you know, I'm not wearing my glasses now, but back then I always wore glasses. So, I mean, without bumping into a wall, no, didn't look a lot like me at all. As we began to work on the case and went further and further into things, then I saw more and more. Patrick had asked me to ask Sharon a series of questions. He wanted them tape recorded so that it would be the exact words of Sharon Johns. During my conversation, her voice started to go from her own voice to the voice of somebody else. As well as seeing visions, Sharon claims she is a channeler. It's a phenomenon that allows spirits to communicate with the living. It was really sort of a surprise to me, too, in that I wasn't really, what you're saying, preparing for this. The voice was very high-pitched. It sounded like a little girl's voice. He's going to kill me. I don't know where Sharon went, but I was talking to somebody else. Can a psychic channeling the voice of a dead woman help change the course of justice? A sailor accused of killing his best friend's wife is about to go on trial. You did it. We know you did it. It was... You gotta be kidding me. When a psychic is asked to help on the case, she says he's innocent. It's like I saw the whole thing just unfold, like a video. And now, in one of her sessions, she claims to channel the voice of the murder victim, Anita Lukander. She started talking in first person about the crime, and she walked me through the crime as it happened. When I'm really into a trans channel, I, I am moved completely out of the way to the point that I don't have any idea of what is being said. He's going to kill me. Mimi tells me that it was a high-pitched little voice. She sounded like a little child. The voice sounded scared and frightened and had expressed that to me, that she was held for days and he would leave her there alone for hours at a time, bound. And she knew that he was going to kill her. And I'll never forget the last words this voice said was, and then it was done. And I took that to mean, and then he killed me. I'd never been a part of something like that before. So at that point, I went over to jail, and I pulled Peter out. And I said, Peter, Peter, what's it Anita sound like? And he said, you couldn't mistake in her voice. She sounded just like a little girl. It's like she is the one that showed me herself um, in that chat that she was in. And by her coming through and actually speaking was amazing in that um, the people that were listening to it heard it, but the recording didn't record it. There was nothing on it but static and there was a lot of distortion on the tape. If the psychic's revelations are accurate, Anita was held captive for several days before being tossed into the waterway. And if this is true, the prosecution's contention that her body had been in the water nine days must be false. When we looked at the autopsy results and the photographs, both Mr. McGinnis and I were very suspicious of the body having, having been in the water for that full nine-day period. And the reason being is that in the intercoastal waterway, even in March, uh, there's a lot of crab activity. To prove their theory, the defense team order a crab test at the same location where Anita's body was found. In the experiment, raw chicken is used in place of human flesh and is placed at the bottom of the river for nine days. While that body is on the bottom especially, it would be attacked by crabs and other animals that are in the water as well. This body had no, none of that kind of activity. If crabs didn't ravage Anita's body, it could only mean that she was not in the waterway for the full nine days. This contradicts the Navy's contention that Peter killed Anita and dumped her body that same night. It makes the so-called confession meaningless and amazingly vindicates the word of a psychic. February 18th, 1997, almost nine years after Anita Lukander's brutal murder, Peter Johnstone goes on trial. Peter was definitely fearful facing trial because he was looking at a life sentence. He'd been behind bars for almost 20 months by the time he'd gone to trial. 
But just as the trial gets underway, the psychic makes an unusual request. Mimi called me and she says, uh, is there anything else that we need to do? We're going to trial. I said, just be sure that you've got that composite. I said, it's very important. I don't know why, but you've got to take it. We had no idea where she was going with that and what the significance would be. Anne Fennell enters the composite sketch into evidence, and it will prove to be pivotal. Trials don't always end up like you want them to end up. It is a, an incredible nerve-wracking experience, much more so than if you're going to trial with someone who you either know or think is guilty. After a three-week trial, the jury begins their deliberations. Just two hours in, the jury requests to see the composite sketch of the man who pawned the guns once again. And we found out there was one holdout in that jury room who uh, wanted to take a closer look at Peter Johnstone. One hour later, the jury reaches a verdict. My heart was, you know, coming out of my chest, and you're just sitting there, and the judge takes a piece of paper, and he reads it, and I'm like, OK. And then he folds it back up, and he hands it back. It was a real nail biter for a few minutes until the jury was seated and the clerk read the verdict. With the jury found the defendant not guilty, so A not guilty verdict in the death of his best friend's wife, Anita Lukander, who was raped, strangled, and mutilated in 1988. On March 17, 1997, just as the psychic predicted, Peter Johnstone walked out of the Jacksonville courtroom a free man. How did the psychic know so much? She said that the key to Peter's defense lay in the composite sketch. She predicted that he would be free in March, and she correctly predicted that Anita had not been thrown straight into the water after the murder, as the prosecution stated. Sharon's contribution to the case had become huge. She invigorated the defense team. We were on a certain defense theories that was what Sharon was seeing, too. It got him looking at other avenues and justifying what she had said. It was great. So I think she, uh, good chance she saved my life. Today, 21 years after Anita Lukander was murdered, Sharon Johns and Peter Johnstone meet for the first time. Oh, you look good. You look it's good. It has. Oh. So, you're welcome. You're welcome. Oh. Doing this work is a big responsibility. I have simply just learned to trust. And what I see, I give. I can't give them any more than what I see or what I hear. To date, the cold-blooded killer of Anita Lukander has never been brought to justice. She was my wife. She's a daughter. She was a sister, an aunt, and... There's only really one person that knows what happened to Anita, and that person needs to come forward and put this to rest. And if he's not man enough to do that, personally, I hope his life's a living hell.